Hi, my name is Lauren Templeton, and you are listening to Investing the Templeton Way. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about investing. In this podcast, I will be interviewing some of the greatest minds from the investment community and exploring topics ranging from international markets to behavioral finance. To learn more, please visit us at investingthetempletonway.com. The information presented in this podcast or available on the website is not intended as and shall not be construed as financial advice. This podcast is produced for entertainment value. Investing is inherently risky, and I encourage you to seek financial advice from a professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Investing the Templeton Way podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Templeton. And I'm your co-host, Scott Phillips. And this podcast, we bring you thought-provoking conversations with experts and leaders across the investment industry. And today, we're thrilled to have Matt McLennan as our guest, who is Portfolio Manager and Head of Global Value at First Eagle Investment Management. I personally have been an investor in First Eagle for many years. With over three decades of experience in the finance industry, Matt has been recognized as one of the top investment managers in the world. He has been with First Eagle since 2008 and has been responsible for managing the firm's global value strategies, overseeing over $80 billion in assets under management. First Eagle itself manages $124 billion. Throughout his career, Matt has been a vocal advocate for value investing, a philosophy that seeks to identify undervalued stocks that have the potential to outperform the broader market over the long term. He's a sought-after speaker and has been featured in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and Barron's. In today's episode, we'll dive deep into Matt's investment philosophy his approach to managing risk in a volatile market, and his outlook for the global economy. So without further ado, let's welcome Matt to the show. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. So I always like to start these shows just getting to know you a little bit better. Um, It sounds like you had an interesting childhood and you grew up in Australia. Is that correct? That's correct. I was was actually born in Papua New Guinea. Uh, The first six years were there and I grew up in Australia thereafter. Wonderful. So how in the world did you become invest, interested in investing and pursuing this career? Well, you know, sometimes in, in life, you have to make all the right mistakes before you, you chart a more reasoned course. And, uh, you know, if I'm honest with myself, and I think back to uh, when I was a teenager in the 1980s, um, I was kind of enticed by what was going on with the corporate raiders at the time. They, they appeared to have sort of discovered this uh, magical elixir to create wealth. And uh, the stock market, you know, as a teenager, sort of seemed like some um, stacked game of a monopoly to me. And um, it, of course, we all know later that the leverage and the overvaluation that these raiders paid uh, and and their behavioral uh, hubris all led to some spectacular implosions in in later years. But at the time, um, it seemed like they were onto something. And at the same time, I had a um, a high school math teacher who figured that he'd, he'd discovered the, the hidden pattern in charting the Dow Jones. And unfortunately for him, he, he put his discovery to work and, and, and tried to, to trade futures around this discovery and, and, and lost it all. And, you know, I, I sort of reflect back on that period and I, I think to myself, you know, why did I get attracted to um, get rich quick type speculation uh, early on in life, as opposed to what I'd now think of as, uh, as investing. And I think, um, you know, as, as we sort of discussed, I was fortunate enough to have grown up uh, in Australia in, a, in, a, in an incredibly happy house in the woods and, you know, surrounded by books and a, and a supportive family. But it was also a, a childhood that was very sort of simple and a, of modest means. We didn't have um, electricity uh, or running water in our house in the woods. And, and uh, I, I guess I had some youthfully naive fire in the belly uh, at that stage and that had sort of ex- exceeded my my wisdom. And um, with the benefit of hindsight, I'd say, though, that I, I was better to have been attracted for the wrong reasons early on when I had very little capital uh, to deploy. And, um, you know, out of 
I guess the the ashes of that period of um, not so great market history, I I took the opportunity to devote myself to learning, um, studying finance, uh, accounting, law, uh, economics, academic literature. I, I I basically devoured it all, and I was fortunate enough to be uh, hired by my thesis supervisor at the time um, uh, into an investment job uh, in 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 Brisbane, uh, Australia. And um, there I got to meet a range of third party managers and they gave me the opportunity to sort of um, distill the threads of continuity amongst their approach. And, uh, you know, I ult- ultimately joined Goldman in the um, uh, the uh, early 1990s and I was well mentored there by folks who'd worked for people like Lou Simpson at Geico or Lou Sanders at Bernstein. And, um, you know, I continued reading and, and, and learning um, and I really just settled on a, a value uh, approach to investing, uh, really looking for businesses that were entrenched and cheap. And I think um, what I took time to learn was that, um, you know, investing done properly is all about compounding out at a satisfactory rate of return and avoiding um, the permanent impairment of capital rather than uh, swinging for the fences. And, I, uh, you know, if I, if I, um, Look back on my my childhood. My mother's approach to gardening was probably a much better metaphor for investing um, than uh, the actions of corporate raiders or uh, stock chart speculators. And so um, that was really uh, what what got me involved in investing. Yes, it's so interesting. Everybody finds their their way to investing and value investing um, in a, on a different path. So it's interesting to learn yours. Well, you've been at First Eagle now for over a decade. Can you talk about the investing landscape and how it's changed over the years and how you've adapted your approach to stay ahead of the curve? So, yeah, it's coming up on 15 years at First Eagle, um, and um, it's it's been a, a, a wonderful experience. And I think, uh, you know, the beauty of the job of being an investor is that the learning curve never stops. Uh, and it's it's a field that really has sort of, um, knowledge consilience, if you will, you know, you're blending science and humanities, um, looking for some sort of asymmetry between price and prospects. Um, it's endlessly interesting. And I think if, as I reflect on um, the last 15 years, I mean, part of the journey uh, for us as a team at First Eagle has been really sort of focusing on how to think about um, the evolving mix of the underlying investment opportunity set to businesses that are characterized by more intangible assets mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to uh, tangible assets. And um, that requires um, somewhat of an evolution of, of thinking. Um, and, you know, that's been a, an area that we spend a lot of time thinking about in addition to um, reflecting with a wary eye on uh, some of the imperfections that we see uh, in the financial architecture globally and, and thinking about how we should navigate potentially uh, troubled borders uh, in the years ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think just from a value investing standpoint, generally, it was kind of an evolutionary process. Maybe you you share that view, Matt. I'm not sure, but when you're kind of focused on the balance sheet and assets, you're dealing with historically accounting conventions that were made close to 100 years ago and have no perception of what we're looking at today. And so it creates these kind of interesting uh, perspectives. What do you do with capitalized cost? You know, are those intangible assets actually worth something? Should you be valuing them? And so I think value investors generally have, have had to come to grips with that. What has been your experience? Well, I, I think you're 100% right. I, I, I think um, when you look at a traditional capital intensive business, a lot of the investment in that business is really only captured in the cash flow statement. You know, if you're expanding mm-hmm. the railroad network or your steel plants or you're building new buildings, um, you know, all of that goes through the cash flow statement. Um, and, you know, if, if you're a company that's built upon intangible assets, whether it's research and development or advertising or um, having a unique sales network, whatever it might be, um, if you're trying to expand um, that business, you're going to be investing through the profit and loss statement. Um, and so, um, you know, one, one really has to sort of adjust for those kinds of differences. And I think just from a balance sheet standpoint, you know, often the two most valuable assets don't show up uh, on, on the asset side of the balance sheet. And by that, I mean, you, you know, for a business, the, the most valuable assets often um, a high level of market share that's been stable generationally. Um, that kind of entrenchment is a very valuable and ta- intangible asset. Incumbency is a very valuable intangible asset, but it doesn't show up on the balance sheet uh, per se. Uh, likewise, 
um, the extent to which there's management acumen uh, in allocating capital over time, um, that doesn't show up on the balance sheet. Yes, there's trace elements of it. You might have a balance sheet that's not that levered or getting high returns on capital, um, but there's no discrete accounting for those assets that are incredibly valuable. Um, and so, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. And, it, you know, at the end of the day, growth is only valuable uh, if it's profitable. And um, the precondition for profitable growth is really some form of advantaged incumbency uh, and a management team um, that focuses on that core advantage uh, and, you know, focuses on efficiency uh, and, and you know, deploys measured behavior. And so uh, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about those variables that are kind of hard to capture uh, in just a financial statement analysis. Well, now that we're talking about growth, I mean, we have been through just the most incredible period uh, with low interest rates and a misallocation of capital. Of course, the extreme valuations of growth stocks, which have somewhat corrected. I mean, Scott and I were counting over 700 stocks in the U.S. at the beginning of 2021, trading at a price to sales multiple of over 20 times. Just some really extraordinary valuations. Um, how how have you experienced um, sort of the rationalization of the market and this higher interest rate environment? Um, have you done anything in your portfolio to reposition or how do you think about that? Well, you're right. 2021 was um, a pretty extreme year in markets. And I think it'll probably go down as a generational low in the cost of capital, you know, mm -hmm. Sovereign interest rates were low; they were below two percent. Um, credit spreads were low. You know, high yield credit spreads were only 250, 260 basis points. And as you point out, earnings multiples were high, revenue multiples were high, price per human was high. Uh, you know, and the the capital markets were wide open. You had SPACs, you had you know all of these um, high growth uh, IPOs, and in fact, I hadn't seen anything really like it uh, since 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, obviously, um, that generational low in the cost of capital, uh, when combined with exceptionally accommodative fiscal policy, um, produced inflation. And um, what we what we saw over 2022 was um, somewhat of a normalization of the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. um, interest rates uh, went, went up to levels more consistent with the historical averages. Um, high yield credit spreads um, blew out to a little bit in excess of their historical averages and earnings multiples on the market came down to levels more consistent with the last couple of decades averages, uh, albeit not not cheap. And, you know, we, we fortunately weathered that storm um, uh, reasonably well um, uh, in the sense that we, we hadn't really participated in those pockets of the market that were pricing um, excessive optionality. We'd We'd sort of stuck to our knitting, um, stuck to situations where the investing arithmetic uh, made sense between the free cash flow yield today and the uh, measured pace of growth and intrinsic value. Um, and you know, people would often ask, you know, how do you know um, how to time value and growth? And I said, you don't know, but I do know that arithmetic you know, ultimately works. And and so um, there wasn't a lot that we had to do differently. Um, we had. Um, during the preceding years, been positioning the portfolio for more resilience, um, sort of leaning into the wind uh, a, a little bit. And um, I, I think that that uh, positioned us to sort of endure last year and, and um, to, to be able to put a little bit of capital to work in the summer. Um, but I think that the place that we're at now um, is, is a little tricky. I know the markets have recovered some and are, are perhaps looking forward to lower inflation and interest rates. Um, but as as I sort of reflect on the current environment, I, I feel that the increase in the cost of capital that we've seen uh, hasn't fully flowed through um, to the economic reality. And I, I think, you know, the bond market is is flashing some warning signals here, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's the yield curve inversion, uh, whether it's the Fed funds rate itself bursting out on the upside of a 40 year downtrend, whether it's high yield credit spreads being wider. And, and I think. We're also starting to see some signs of um, slowing economic momentum. You know, some of the expectation surveys, new orders for I the ISM services and manufacturing new orders or the conference board consumer expectations. Um, there's signs of the labor market uh, softening at the margin. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, when the momentum shifts negatively, um, you know, it, it tends to run for some time. And so I, I think this is um, a moment in time where 
uh, we might have seen the early stage of the adjustment uh, of, of repricing, um, but there, there may be um, uh, more challenges that lie ahead. So tell me why your portfolio at First Eagle is well positioned to weather that market if we have a hard landing, recession, et cetera. Well, well let, me, let me say up front um, that, that we have enough humility to recognize that if, if we have a hard landing, um, no one's going to be immune from that mm-hmm. in, in totality. That you know, We are uh, a long-only manager and, and you know, we have over 70% of the portfolio invested in equities, but... Um, you know, our hope would be to avoid um, the worst of potential uh, permanent negative impairments of capital uh, during a downdraft. And we have enough ballast in the portfolio um, between um, our cash and, and our gold holdings um, to not only be able to sort of weather a storm, but to, to be a selective uh, purchaser uh, of securities that offer a deeper margin of safety um, in, in a more distressed environment. And uh you know the one the one thing that is is kind of weighing on me here as I sort of think about markets and the and the issues that we went through with the recent sort of banking um, uh, crises is that you know what we might be seeing here is the opening stages of a more more of a sovereign credibility crisis uh, in in the United States. If you think about the last few cycles that that we've been through um, in the late '90s that we talked about before. Um, the credit problems emerged in the corporate sector. You'll remember the Enrons, the WorldComs, um, those situations. Um, and then in the mid 2000s, you know, people had moved credit-wise into the into housing credit, mortgages, you know, low-risk credit. You know, house prices never go down. Um, and you know, I think where is the where's the excess stack of debt today? It's in the sovereign sector. Um, you know, especially following um, the large fiscal stimulus uh, with COVID, there was a huge amount of um, sovereign debt issuance. And uh, one of the things that strikes me as a, a kind of a very meaningful difference uh, between what we saw in um, the most recent year and what we saw in 1999 is that it, you'll call back in 1999, the last time we had about uh, below 4% unemployment, that uh, there was a budget surplus in the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the last year, with three and a half percent unemployment, we had close to a six percent deficit, and so uh, we're not on a fiscally sustainable course. Right. And if you think about where the problem surfaced in the banking sector, it was um, losses on sovereign securities, whether they were longer dated treasuries or whether they were mortgage backed securities, with the implicit backing of the state. And I think one of the ironies of our financial architecture is that for banks. Sovereign assets have close, to, you know, either zero or low risk weighting, depending on the nature of them. Um, yet we know that sovereign debt is not risk free. Um, if you have unsustainable fiscal policy uh, or you have sort of um, um, inappropriate monetary policy, you can suffer meaningful capital losses. Sure. Um, and so I think we're maybe at a moment where um, the confidence in the sustainability of our fiscal picture uh, could come into question. And I think that presents a whole host of uh, different challenges for investors. It sure does. Um, uh, that it is, it's very interesting time to be an investor and to think about positioning the portfolio for that. So how First Eagle has a great history of preserving capital on the downside. That's what we like about First First Eagle. When we're looking at putting First Eagle on our personal portfolio or talking to clients about First Eagle, we like the history of preserving capital on the downside. How as a company, do you have the culture, how do you keep your wits about you in these crazy irrational markets like the one we've had over the past 10 years? How is that so preserved into the culture at First Eagle? It's, it's, it's very challenging psychologically um, because in an environment like 2021 or 1999, um, you, you have to be willing to be short social acceptance. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, people will view what you're doing as sort of static and and not keeping up with the times in a moment of um, in exuberance uh, like we saw in, in 2021. And um, part of what we do is to spend a lot of time um, being frank with our clients about who we are and who we're not, mm-hmm. uh, you know, setting realistic expectations. And I think that's important because, if you promise to be all things to all people, then you're almost forced to change with the times rather than to chart a steady course. Um, you know, the second thing is that, you know, we have, I guess the benefit of 
uh, an approach that's been time tested. I mean, the, the, the global strategy traces its roots back to 1979. Um, and so I think that the fact that you're acting as custodians uh, of an approach that's been time tested um, gives you some staying power uh, than if you're experimenting uh, with a newer approach. And then um, I think it's, you know, it comes down to the sort of um, the, the simple fact that, you know, when we look at the portfolios bottom up, um, you know, we invest in what makes sense. You know, if we're worried about um, fiscal issues and monetary policy, then it makes sense that we hold some gold as a, as a potential hedge. In fact, when I look at the last century of investing history, when equities have had their lost decades have often been when gold has had its best decades. And so um, having um, some anchor uh, in a potential hedge like gold gives us the, the patience uh, to endure extremes in markets. And I think um, just seeing opportunity bottom up, even though the market itself got pretty expensive, um, you know, the international stock universe was at a 50 year low relative to the US. If you just looked at the ratio of the MSCI EFA um, and compared it to the S&P 500, it was at a 50 year low. And so um, for a long term investor for whom the arithmetic matters, um, the combination of sort of cheap currencies and 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 um, higher free cash flow yields gives you the, the conviction, if you will, um, to stay the course. And then, you know, when we looked at sort of, you know, what what we own bottom up, uh, we, we'd see that we weren't just like skewed towards things that were statistically cheap, but, um, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on businesses that have scarcity value um, and that have innate persistence, whether, uh, you know, if we're in, in the world of um, newer companies, we have entrenched software, but more mature companies that aren't excessively valued or um, locationally advantaged scarce real assets or companies that um, have local market services density, you know, 50 or 60 percent market share in local markets or companies that have generational brand equity uh, or heritages of like honing precision products. Um, when you look at the nature of the businesses we own, um, you, you just start to get more comfortable that these are businesses that should um, grow in a measured pace over time. And if they offer attractive free cash flow yields, give you the ability to generate sound uh, real returns. Um, and so it's, you know, keeping centered uh, amidst these kind of crazy times is really a function of um, having a clear philosophy, a clear sense of true north, but also um, feeling comfortable with what you own bottom up. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a combination of those two two variables. You know, one of the things that I think is a little bit unusual about First Eagle is your gold position. I mean, that's what I always think of when I think of First Eagle. I think about, you know, there's going to be some exposure to gold and gold mining stocks. The other thing I think about when I think about First Eagle as a manager, and please correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, because I certainly could be. But I think that um, compared to most managers in the industry, you at sometimes will have, First Eagle will at sometimes have larger cash balances in the portfolio than the average manager, maybe as much as 30% in the past. Do you want to comment on the use of gold and the use of cash in the portfolios and the strategy behind that? Sure. So, um, you know, I think that our philosophy is one um, where we're almost better thought of as business gardeners or business collectors uh, than we are um, stock traders. Mm -hmm. And um, that means that when we approach the, the task of investing, we tend to have a more absolute mindset. Um, and the reason I mention that is that, you know, we only put cash to work if we find a business we like at a price we like. And there are some environments where it's harder to do that. And we might be trimming names that have become more fully valued. And so the cash will build as a residual of that disciplined approach to um, investing. And and then in, in windows of distress, all of a sudden, there's fewer stocks that we want to sell uh, because they're trading with a wider margin of safety and price. Uh, and there are businesses that may have been on our wish list that are all of a sudden attractive to us. Um, and so we put that cash to work. And, and if you look over the last 15 years, our largest cash drawdowns were in Q1 of um, uh, 2009 in the wake of the global financial crisis and in Q1 of 2020 during the COVID mm -hmm. distress. So um, the cash is really thought of as a sort of deferred purchasing power. Uh, we want to be primarily owners of business. Um, but we only want to do so on sensible terms. And so the cash 
will ebb and flow throughout the business cycle. Um, the gold is in some ways a longer term form of deferred purchasing power. The problem with cash is that, you know, over the last 50 years, the yield on cash has been less than the rate of money supply growth in the economy. And so while it provides for nominal stability in the short term, um, it's a different form of wealth destruction uh, over the long term mm -hmm. um, because you're not keeping pace with the rate of monetary creation. Um, now, uh, gold is a little different from cash because it offers no yield, uh, but it's constrained in supply. Um, and in, in, in a way, um, it's perhaps not surprising that because we broke the link uh, between our currency and gold in the early 1970s, because we didn't want the discipline of gold, it's perhaps not a surprise that gold has outperformed uh, our money uh, over time. And so, you know, over the last 50 years, um, money supply has compounded out at 6 or 7%. Cash has been closer to 5%. Um, and gold has been north of 8%. Um, and, and gold... Um, ironically is, is interesting for us as a potential hedge. Um, and people say, well, why would you hold this sort of useless lump of, um, yellow metal? And I, and I am like, the, well, the paradox is that its utility as a, as a potential hedge is its uselessness as a commodity. Anything that's useful, um, has its price being very sensitive to the business side, yeah. you know, iron or copper, mm -hmm. you know, you, um, land prices, what, whatever it may be. Um, Gold is chemically inert, uh, which means that it tends to be um, uh, more inversely related um, to the business cycle. In fact, um, its inertness means that it lasts indefinitely, um, and it means that it has a more steady supply because the gold mined in any one year is only 1.5% of the total amount of gold uh, outstanding. And so it's very predictable supply, um, and it means that gold's price tends to, to be inversely correlated with real interest rates. And over time, um, because of its scarcity, um, it tends to go up in line with um, money supply and nominal activity. Um, and so, you know, as far as hedge assets go, um, it, we found it more attractive than, say, buying put options because they cost a lot to buy put options and you have to be right on the timing. And we're humble enough to know that we can't time markets. Um, and um, it's had a better risk reward um, than owning sovereign paper, um, you know, given the, uh, the sovereign challenges that we've, we've outlined earlier in the discussion. So we've settled on gold as a sort of longer term uh, potential hedge and a longer term form of deferred purchasing power. If we were to go through a, a lost decade in stocks uh, or something worse like the 1930s or the 1970s, um, then I would imagine that you'd see us progressively start first to, to deploy the cash and then ultimately to deploy some of the gold uh, in the ownership of business at my, my, on much more advantageous terms than today. Yeah, you bring up uh, some really interesting topics uh, there, Matt, in relation to gold. And in particular, um, you know, this, this idea that gold can offset geopolitical events, but really its utility comes in the negative real interest rates. And so I'm wondering, you know, with the Fed funds futures almost unanimously saying that the Fed is going to be cutting rates soon. This is set up for one of those dynamics where the Fed, as you pointed out in your annual letter, missed an opportunity in 2021. And maybe they make another mistake and inflation and wage rates are just too sticky. Yeah, no, it's, it's such a great question. Um, you know, I think we've seen a number of policy mistakes, unfortunately, over the last few years. I mean, I think the biggest of which was the second fiscal package, uh, because um, you, if you think back to the beginning of 2021, um, we'd already started rolling out the vaccine. Um, you know, we, we had, um, you know, business confidence had already recovered. That's the time where you'd start to dial back the stimulus typically, but we had a kind of trillion dollar type um, stimulus program. And, and now we're in a fiscally unsustainable situation. Um, and, and then the Fed also changed its approach. It said, you know what? Uh, we're not going to target inflation. We're going to do average inflation rate targeting. So we're going to wait till we see inflation. And what that meant is by the time inflation was upon us, the genie was out of the bottle. And the Fed could no longer tap the brake. It had to pull, you know, it had to pull the handbrake. Um, and, and so the Fed, um, you know, may now be just as it sort of missed inflation risk, maybe missing, uh, financial stability risk. Um, the fact that we had a 40 year downtrend, um, in policy rates and, um, we've just broken out on the upside means that 
we're going to test the vulnerable points uh, of the debt stack uh, in in the economy in you know in the coming quarters as economic activity uh, softens and so um you know when when you own something like um gold uh, which is a perpetual asset what matters is not just what's happening now but what happens on the next roll um and it's interesting to me that you know gold had had somewhat of a peak back in in 2020 and it started to soften ahead of uh, two year rates and fed policy rates moving up so it's almost like gold market anticipated the need for tightening um and more recently um the gold market's had a, a pretty firm bit to it and i think uh probably because of what you're saying that um the fed is going to force themselves into a tricky situation where we have a financial stability issue um that means they have to ease policy ahead of solving the inflation problem or um that we end up in a recession uh and there are pockets of debt vulnerability and they have to ease policy to address that and so i think gold might be sniffing out um the prospect of lower real interest rates and the fact that even though the nominal level of interest rates went up this cycle quite a lot um it's still below the year over year rate of inflation um and so if we get into worse state of the world from here um rates could move into more deeply negative territory particularly if the sovereign debt um uh dynamics are not that attractive um you know there tends to be an element of financial repression um used to solve um sovereign debt problems and so uh, i think the gold markets might be smelling something and you know if we look at the last couple of uh cycles um gold typically hasn't peaked out until um the forward curve for interest rates has troughed and i think we're uh, probably some ways away from that we don't try to predict uh where it's going to go we're not smart enough to do that um but i i i do think that the behavior of gold is telling us something uh about vulnerabilities in the system and the final thing i'll mention is that um and this is a harder thing to gauge but the dollar is let's say 60% of world currency reserves there's a game changer when uh Russia invaded Ukraine we sanctioned the ability of the Russians to access um their dollar reserves and you have to think if you're China or you're Saudi Arabia or someone else who's a reserve accumulator are you less incentivized um to acquire dollars as reserves now than you were before um and um and so that's just a provocative question that's out there and we know from the World Gold Council that there's been more foreign central bank buying of gold in the last year than there has been for quite some time mm mm-hmm. This is a great uh comments. There's one other uh question I, that I've always been curious about and I think this is really neat that that y'all do this. Um you not only own bullion, but then you'll go and look at the miners as well. Yeah. And so there's ask. a value investing play within that. And I'm wondering just how you kind of go through that decision making process. Like what's mm-hmm. more attractive than the others? Is it just valuation driven yeah. or You know, it's it's a good question. We and we 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 don't trade uh too much, but I, I guess our feeling is if we're willing to hold gold in a vault we should be willing to hold it in the dirt via the miners uh if there's a margin of safety in price and and so our approach when we look at the gold miners is that we uh we look at the existing mine plans for those miners and and we look at uh, their cost structure and um what the runoff value of those uh, uh producing reserves would be uh, at current spot prices and if we can get a, a meaningful discount in the public markets um uh, we'll take that and then we get the uh opportunity of their resource optionality at a very low price um you know if if prices go up resources that they have can be converted to producing reserves and so um you know there's some uh incremental optionality that we hopefully get at low price uh, through some of the miners and and um one one other thing i would sort of say is that you know there've been environments in the past where the miners were a, a a hedge on the potential hedge of gold such as the 1930s uh where Roosevelt compulsorily acquired gold um and the one way you could own it was through the miners um and so there've been states of the world uh where the miners um have ironically been um, a safe way to access um gold Yeah, it's so interesting. Well, First Eagle, you're head of global the global <laughs> portfolio at First Eagle. Tell me your thoughts on the different uh regions of the world. I think I read that currently you have about 50% in the United States, but what are your thoughts on China and Europe and different areas of the world right now? Where are you seeing opportunities? Yeah, so we we're great believers in um diversification. uh mm-hmm. you know, if if you accept uncertainty uh as a, a fact of life 
uh, it means that the tails of reality are going to be far fatter than what you would predict with a statistical distribution. And um, that leads us to be open minded to diversifying across industries and across the globe. And so our portfolio has been quite balanced. You know, roughly half of our equities have been in the US, as you point out, and the other half have been outside the United States. Um, and the, the United States has obviously been a very strong um, equity market, but it, it, the United States does not have a monopoly on good businesses. Um, and so it pays to be open minded to opportunities that you see outside the United States. And so, you know, in, in Europe, um, you know, what's been appealing to us um, has been some of the consumer branded goods companies that uh, really have uh, very strong uh, brands that have been around for a long time, in many cases have strong emerging market footprints. Um, and that offer free cash flow yields that are closer to 6% than the, you know, the 4% that you'd get on similar companies in the United States. Um, you know, one of the other things that's interesting uh, in Europe is there's a range of investment holding companies uh, where, um, again, these are often stewarded by uh, families uh, or founders um, where, you know, you, you can essentially get exposure to the, the stocks that they own um, at a meaningful discount to the sum of the parts. Uh, and so you can get a double discount uh, through some of these holding companies. And, and again, it's harder to find these situations um, in the United States. It, throughout Asia, um, we see some interesting uh, situations. In Japan, one of the areas that we've focused on over the years has been um, the factory automation space. There have been some, um, you know, Japan has the world leaders in um, CNCs, robotics, pneumatics, electrical sensors, all the things that are needed to uh, automate um, the factory of tomorrow. And if we ever were to see um, a deglobalization of factory supply chains, uh, we're sure going to need the technology that resides uh, in those Japanese companies. Um, you know, in, in places like Latin America, uh, where valuations got quite depressed mm -hmm. uh, uh, during COVID, um, there is even though those economies can be wildly cyclical, there are some very cash flow generative businesses that are quite stable. Um, think of the brewing and the beverages industry uh, in Latin America. And some of these companies have 60, 70 percent market share positions um, where, you know, we are able to build positions at single digit cash flow multiples. Um, and, um, you know, these are just very attractive businesses. And, and the, the last thing I'll sort of mention, um, you know, in, in Europe is some of the luxury products companies over the years. Um, again, uh, Tiffany's doesn't exist anymore. It was acquired. Um, to, so my, my point being that one of the motivations for us to go overseas is not that we're making a tactical call on valuations, albeit multiples are about a third lower overseas and currencies have been depressed versus the dollar. Um, but it's, it's for the simple reason that as business collectors, there are some great businesses outside the United States. Um, and, um, you know, I guess we have a lot of institutional memory having been invested globally um, uh, since the late 70s as an organization. It brings up a, a really interesting question to me, at least, Matt. Um, I completely understand what you're saying with the, the bottom up analysis. And um, but at the same time, I'm also thinking that you guys are also finely tuned into risk. And I would assume that includes geopolitical, of course. Where do you kind of draw the line in terms of, well, that's more institutional risk than I want to take in terms of things like property rights and some of these other factors that are more difficult for an analyst, a bottom up analyst to see? Where do they filter into your picture? No, it's, like it's just a great for question. instance, like China and some of those. It's a great those question. Issues. Um, we had no invest, no direct investments in Russia, for example. Um, you, you know, in 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 the strategies that the, that we've discussed today, um, and you know, I think that's a, a reflection of some concerns around things like property rights. I think China has been a, a little more complex and nuanced because it is so much larger um, than than Russia and. I think one of the things that's been interesting about China is that um, because of the geopolitics, it's it's been marching to a, a very different business cycle um, than than the United States. Um, the Chinese market was going down when we were having the bubble that we were talking about, and so uh, you know we have seen um, you know one or two opportunities over the years in um, like for example Hong Kong property holding listed property holding companies uh, where the holding companies trade at very large discounts to the private market valuations of the underlying real estate and typically hold much less leverage than say a REIT uh, in the United States. Um, you know, we've also seen some opportunities uh, for, uh, uh, there's one holding company we own in Europe 
that owns a stake in a, in a Chinese uh, company uh, that is a very strong underlying business and um, the valuation margin of safety is wide and the European company is doing a stock repurchase. And so, um, you know, you, you have these situations where um, you, you feel that there's enough of a margin of safety and price uh, to make an investment. Um, you know, we've had some investments in Taiwan over the years. And so, um, you know, I think the reality is that you cannot avoid all geopolitical risk and that as we sort of started this conversation earlier on, unfortunately, there's um, sovereign and geopolitical risk in the United States uh, as well. Um, and, and so part of our solution is just to, to be diversified. Um, there are some markets we haven't gone into, as, as discussed. Uh, otherwise, it's to be diversified, to have a margin of safety and price and to look at the underlying business character um, and the history of management doing rational things with the cash flow. Yeah, well, it is. Um, you have so many similarities to First Eagle has so many similarities to John Templeton's philosophy on investing, which is global in nature. And I've heard you talk a lot about um, the mistakes of temperament and how important it is to exercise patience, humility, and flexibility. Mm -hmm. I see that so much in the investment philosophy of First Eagle. You can see the patience, the humility, the flexibility built into the strategy. Do you have any uh, tips or comments for investors in cultivating that right temperament? Well, I, I think, you, you know, I, I would just make the point that um, – when it comes to investing, I think to be a whole investor, there's an analytical toolkit you need, but the temperament needs to be weighed against that. Um, I remember when I went to Egypt uh, at the end of 2019, um, and I took the family through some um, some pyramids and some tombs and things like this, and um, there was interesting hieroglyphics where they weigh the heart against a feather uh, to determine the soul. Humility uh, stems from just recognition of uncertainty. Uh, and I think in some ways, you know, when people come to investors, they're like, well, we want you to have the crystal ball. We want you to tell us exactly what's going to happen in the world. Um, but it's it's far more powerful to accept that you don't know for sure uh, because you end up um, investing in each situation uh, with more of a margin of safety. Um, you expose yourself to a wider um, sea of opportunities uh, and um, the, the consequences of making a mistake uh, are more absorbable um, if you have an error tolerant approach. And so um, just accepting it is really important. And, and I'd say the same thing on patience. You know, I, I, I think back to the gardening discussion we were having earlier today that, um, you, you know, there were many things that my mother planted that took many years to come to fruition, um, but it was worth the wait. And, and a lot of good things uh, in, in life take time. I mean, um, you know, a great artist is only often recognized a generation or two after they've painted uh, their work and it survived the test of time. Um, and in, in, in investing, the, to, to us, the most predictable sources of outperformance um, in a world that's largely unpredictable are things that take time to play out. Like for valuation discounts to correct, it's a, it's a passage of years. If you've got a, a really strong business that can generate more free cash flow, that accretes slowly to your benefit. Uh, over years, if management are doing sensible things with that cash flow, the benefits of that tend to accrete slowly over time. And ironically, um, when people look for rapid growth, or they're often in industries that are characterized by rapid change, and your ability to be certain of what a company will be worth in five or seven years uh, time is often lower in those industries with rapid change. And so, um, you know, we think temperament's incredibly important. Uh, we want to surround ourselves at First Eagle with people who are smart and nice um, and, and, um, and, and are willing to sort of think long term. Yeah, I've heard you comment a lot about that long-term focus and avoiding avoiding short-term thinking, and that has been a bit unusual in this past market <laughs> uh, over the past decade. I feel like investors are getting more short-term in their thinking, and that benefits will accrue to long-term having a long-term investment horizon. What is your investment time horizon? Well, if you look at our portfolio turnover, it's just a little bit above 10%. So if you mm -hmm. invert that, it's, it, it implies that we have about a decade horizon, which is longer than most private equity yeah. uh, investing. Um, there are a number of investments we've held for decades. So it's, it's, it's truly 
uh, long term in nature. And, and I think um, that's a distinguishing uh, feature of, of, of the way we invest. And I, I think it, it's clarifying for people to know that if they're going to invest, they're going to own something for the long term. And um, it makes you think twice about the kind of business you want to put money into and, and the price point at which you want to do that. And, and um, I'm a great believer that there should be aggressive reflection, but only selective action uh, mm -hmm. in portfolio management. And I think what I see a lot out in the marketplace is aggressive action and selective reflection. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's the, the paradox of the investing world. And and so how what are your how does that work in at First Eagle as a portfolio manager? Are you making the investment decisions? Are you sitting down with a committee? Y'all are talking about different stocks. You have about a hundred stocks in the portfolio yep. and a global universe. So probably the MSCI um, Acqui would be your universe. Yeah. So so if you if you think about. Um, First Eagle. One of one of the secrets of, of First Eagle is that it's really a team of teams, mm -hmm. um, as, as opposed to you know being about any one individual. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at each of our strategies, um, there tend to be um, you know, two to four portfolio managers. Sometimes a little bit more on the strategy, and um, and we don't divide up the portfolios between the portfolio managers. But what what we've done is with intentionality, we we've we've typically had thought of the job of managing portfolios as kind of a partnership exercise where um, you acknowledge as a portfolio manager that no one on the team has a monopoly on the truth. Um, and, and you know, it, it encourages uh, a very sort of open discussion of ideas before we, we make them. And um, to the extent that one person on the team is not comfortable with an investment, we tend to veer to that more conservative perspective. Um, so it's a high hurdle for an idea to come into the portfolios. And if we've owned something for five or 10 years and one of the portfolio managers starts to be wary, um, again, we tend to sort of veer to that perspective. So it tends to be a lower hurdle to exit. Um, mm -hmm. so the, the purpose of, of having teams of portfolio managers is to make sure that we're allocating capital prudently um, and to, manage, to make sure that we're um, really stewarding a, a philosophy and an approach um, as opposed to relying on the prescience of any single uh, individual uh, to pick stocks. What are the other aspects of your sell discipline? I mean, you just commented on it a little bit that if somebody is wary, but I almost find that it's um, more worrisome if, near, never, if nobody has any concerns about any of the positions, how do you make that sell decision? No, it's, it's a great uh, question, in fact. One of the things that always provides me with discomfort is when someone says, well, what are your favorite ideas? And it's like, well, I understand every idea has its imperfections. Um, and, and I think it's important to understand that uh, when you invest, that every idea has um, ways that it can go wrong. Um, and so just thinking through the ways in which things could go wrong is a, is a good place to start. Um, you know, in terms of the cell discipline, you know, one of the paradox of our business is as well that it's often... Um, you know, hardest to sell something when it's most expensive because in the rear vision mirror, um, the business has likely performed very well. Um, revenues might have exceeded expectations, margins might have gone up, management might have done a few smart things, um, and people feel good about the business. But as an objective uh, check, we'll sometimes stand back and we'll say, look at the 20 year cumulative log returns of a stock, or um, we'll look at where the enterprise value of that business has been relative to revenues over the last couple of decades. And if we're really at a high point, um, it's a good point to sort of reassess, have we, um, have we lost our valuation margin of safety? Should we be at least shrinking this position? Um, and then the other kind of difficult um, thing about selling is that if, a, if something hasn't worked out, usually the market has derated the security. So you're in this sort of angst quadrant where the business is not as good as you thought it was, um, but the price is lower. So what do you, what do, you do? Um, and, you know, I think one of the problems in more concentrated portfolios is people tend to sort of double down because they they have behavioral commitment to their concentrated portfolio. Uh, it's one of the things we're very conscious of not doing at First Eagle is not just reflexively doubling down on a stock that's down. Um, we really like to sort of ask ourselves, is there something about the market position that's subject to fade at the moment? Or is there something about management's behavior that's highly likely to dilute us? 
One uh, question I had just to follow up on that, Matt, is uh, how do you determine, like, let's just say a 3% position from a 1%? Do they start at the same size or do you have more conviction in some versus others? You know, it's, it, position sizing is um, a really important um, discussion here at First Eagle. We, we you know, in fact, I, you know, I had a, a meeting with the other portfolio managers over the last week where we sort of talked about, you know, let's continue to, to think through our philosophy of position sizing. And if I could sort of summarize it, um, you know, it's it's a combination of the investing arithmetic, you know, the margin of safety and price, but also um, the the degree to which we are comfortable that we fully understand um, the business's prospects. Um, and so it's not just alpha, it's a, it's a certainty equivalence um, that, that matters. And so one, I think one of the mistakes that investors often make is that they'll have huge weightings in stocks they think are big discounts or have large growth prospects, um, but they may not have uh, uh, paid as much attention to the stability of the business. Um, and and so for, for us, for a position to be a decent size, it tends to need both evaluation margin of safety um, and um, a degree of entrenchment that we feel comfortable with or incumbency um, that, that gives us a sense that the business is going to have um, clear terminal value in five or 10 years time. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I guess my last question for you would just be, what should invest, what's keeping you up at night right now? What are, what should investors be most worried about right now? Um, I would ask about the opportunities, but I think you're going to say that international markets present opportunities. We've already commented on that a little bit. Um, what, what's keeping you up at night, Matt? Hey, what, what's keeping me up at night is um, some of the fiscal and sovereign debt issues um, mm -hmm. that we discussed, you know, earlier in the podcast. Um, the fact that we, you know, we're running uh, the sort of deficits we are at the peak of the economic cycle, um, you know, worries me uh, because if there's not a, a credible fiscal outlook, then that in turn um, affects um, inflation expectations long term, and it it increases the risk of us entering into a window that's that's more stagflationary uh, in in nature and. Um, the 1970s was not a pretty period for for investing, and so um, you know, and and we've we've there's not a lot of political will on either side of the spectrum here um, to address fiscal challenges, and and um, you know, when that's the case, sometimes markets force the issue, uh, and and so uh, you know that's just one thing um, that. Um, it, at the back of my reflections right now, uh, you know, we try to invest in a way such that those sorts of worries don't keep us up at night. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, if, if the asset that's seen as risk free is all of a sudden not seen as risk free, um, that upends a lot of things in markets. And and so let's hope it doesn't come to pass. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, you asked me the question, so I'm, I'm answering honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your time today. And where can investors who have an interest in First Eagle go to learn more about your company, your strategies, or read your annual letter? I think it's pretty much all available uh, on the website, uh, mm -hmm. the First Eagle website. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, if, if investors are dealing with their own wealth advisors, um, their wealth advisors probably have access to a range of uh, different resources as it would relate to First Eagle. Um, but, you know, I, I will say that um, if I look at the team members of First Eagle, one thing that characterizes the team members is they've largely bought into our investment philosophy before even joining. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I noticed that about our clients too, that, um, you know, it, it's always a source, source of um, uh uh, joy for me in some ways when I get to meet with clients and many of whom have been invested with us for decades um, and um, they've really sort of internalized the mindset and and I think if you if you have that amongst your employees and your customers you know hopefully you create a business that has sustainability as well yeah well we've enjoyed being a first eagle investor and big believer in everything you do and 
Really appreciate the time you've spent with us today. And I know our listeners will enjoy learning more about your strategy and your thoughts on global markets. So thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to have the discussion. I, I've, in, I've enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the to and fro and, and look forward to seeing you both soon.